is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. So in our in our in our quarantine quest for content, these two men have stepped up to the plate and they've delivered some of the best uh, wrestling related content in this period of time when we could use it so so badly right now. Evan Husney and Jason Eisner are on with me, uh, the uh, creators and the men behind the entire Dark Side of the Ring series on Vice TV, which has been fueling all of us for so many weeks now. Jason, Evan, what's the haps, guys? Hey, thanks for having hey. me. Yeah, well, yeah. thanks for uh, thanks for making all these wrestling documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're welcome. Everyone's welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, we talked, uh, I, I think during the first season, we talked, uh, and it might have been, I don't know if it was before anything had aired, or it might have been just as the Bruiser Brody episode had aired, but it was when yeah. Dark Side of the Ring was still kind of an unproven uh, thing. You know, it was just this, it was right. it was still an idea. I was like, I, I think it's amazing that this is happening, but it was a, it was a we'll see. And I think clearly, here's here's the two reasons why I think Vice to me is clearly like, yeah, this is, this is money. We love this thing. Number one, because obviously second season, you went from six episodes to 10 episodes, which is a huge leap. And number two Mm -hmm. is the topic, the topics of this season's episode. So we've got your big kind of marquee topics, which are starting the season with Benoit, ending the season Mm -hmm. with Owen, middle of the season is Snooker. Those are huge topics to tackle. But then in the middle there, these are the episodes that, as a wrestling geek, I look forward to the most, which is the episodes where you're sitting there going, I don't know how an hour of content is going to come out of this, but I can't wait to see it. That's the Brawl for All. Uh, that's the Dino <laughs> Bravo story. That's the stuff where where you could tell a normal person who's not a wrestling fan, I just spent an hour of my time watching a documentary about this thing, and they'll just look at you like a dog who's heard like a really <laughs> high-pitched... <laughs> Ding! Uh, did, did you get any of those uh, crooked head dog reactions when you were explaining to Vice? Look, here's the topics that we want to tackle this season. They include uh, Dino Bravo and his mob-related life, and 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 Herb Abrams and UWF. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's this wrestling promoter that nobody's heard of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, I mean, no, I think. Uh... I think because of kind of what we had proven with season one, it, you know, we, 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 we've been uh, fortunate to not have any real pushback or anything in terms of the episode we, we wanted to do. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to try and create like a, like a, a, a group of episodes that, that feature different types of stories and have like lots of variants in terms of, you know, cause you have a lot of subjects, like some of the more tentpole ones like you're describing that are, you know, difficult, hard, very, very, very dark stories, and we wanted to also mix it up and have some stories that have just different, like the, the uh, Dr. D. David Schultz episode kind of has a different flavor. The Brawl for All definitely does. And then, of course, Herb Abrams and the <laughs> UWF, that story uh, couldn't be, you know, that one's definitely way different than all the others that we've done. So I think, yeah, I, I think we just wanted variants, and, um, and uh, you know, a, a lot of these episodes have been challenging to, like, you know, for us to either boil down to an hour or get to an hour, but we, we realize as we're going through it, there's just so much, there's so much nuance to all these stories. And it's just, it's been super exciting. Yeah. And after we did the first season, um, we put it out a call on all our social media platforms for everyone to weigh in as to like what they wanted to see us cover if we got a season two. And we just like yeah. had thousands and thousands of responses and to our surprise, like, you know, Dino, the, the story of Dino Bravo was near the very top of that list of what people wanted to see. Um, yeah, like top five. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. that. I mean, I wanted to see it. I think we talked about that, you know, a way long time ago that you had had the idea for that kind of in season one and it didn't make the cut. And I was fascinated by it because it is one of those things that's, I think, the perfect type of subject matter for this for wrestling fans because the Dino Bravo thing is one of those wrestling stories that everybody kind of knows the legend of and everybody remembers, Mm -hmm. you know, but you heard about it on like 
you heard about it in high school or you heard about it somewhere from some guy who's like, oh, remember Dino Bravo? Oh, you know what happened to him after right. he left? And you heard a hundred different stories of it. But there really, I don't think, has been a lot of here's the story. This is this is what happened. You kind of know the legend, but you don't know mm -hmm. the story. You know what I'm saying? And for us, too, it was like we didn't. It was hard to just even get a grasp of who Dino Bravo was as a person. Yeah, you know, there wasn't a lot out there. There's not, there's not many book, books like written about him. But like, that was really eye opening for us is when we got to spend time with his daughter and his wife. Was just getting to know who Dino Bravo was as a person, and and right. even some of his early career work that we were not too familiar with. It just it made us even more of a fan of his. Like as we went through the process of making it. Do you or have there been totally. Has there been any this season that you've been surprised has kind of uh, penetrated through the wrestling uh, audience and, and you've heard from people who aren't necessarily wrestling fans, hey, this one stuck with me? I hear well, so much feedback from, like, my friends and even just, like, distant family members that I haven't really heard of that are always like, man, <laughs> that new Jack episode. Yes, that yes. Dude, uh, that's why I brought this up because, you know, talking to comedians and stuff that don't watch wrestling, you know, I'll bring up, oh, I've been watching this. They'll go, did you see that New Jack documentary that was on the other night? Like, every <laughs> the New Jack one is the one that is that has hit, the, hit, hit a nerve of people yeah. who aren't wrestling fans. It's really true. <laughs> yeah, you think Tiger King was crazy. You got to see this New Jack. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, definitely the uh, New Jack episode, I think, has has, has made the rounds um, amongst, you know, non-wrestling folks the most. But um, as far as, like, the wrestling audience, like, I was a little surprised by to the Dr. D. David Schultz episode. And, um, you know, obviously being our second highest rated episode, I, I wouldn't have predicted that. But it, it just was kind of one of those things that, you know, I think a lot of people – Either it was kind of a departure, you know, from from the darkness, and uh, also just seeing John Stossel, uh, his <laughs> point of view on the story, and uh, it was cool because I think it was it was a cool challenge for us to try and make an episode, you know, just basically based on two slaps that happened, you know, 35 years ago, um, you know. So, but uh, yeah, that just the whole response that we've been getting to that episode has been very interesting and very very um, something I didn't predict. Yeah, well, that was definitely one. Where when I watched it, I was going, I don't even, I, I feel like they had nine episodes and they're just stretching an hour out of this 2020 thing because I've watched it on YouTube. <laughs> like I've seen it. And then when I actually watched it and I saw, oh, there's a much bigger story here. We're now getting the perspective of Dr. D and the career and how it slowed down. And did it slow down because of this or was it, would it have slowed down right. anyway? And and that whole conversation open, uh, opens up. Then you get to hear the perspective of John Stossel. And you realize that this guy is still mad. <laughs> You're like, what are you mad about? Like, yeah. this, what did you expect yeah. was going to happen? <laughs> and then, to me, the best part of it was the third part, which I, I didn't even consider when I thought about the story, which is it really is the generational mark of old school kayfabe, protect the business wrestling, and sports entertainment. I mean, that is the moment, to me, when that switch was kind of made and you either sided with Definitely. Dr. D who's trying to protect the business quote unquote, or you sided with Stossel and eventually WWE to say, Hey, 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 this is sports entertainment. This is, this is a, a show that we're putting on for families. Um, and that part, yeah. that part yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize. That's cool. Yeah. For like Evan and us, we're so like, like we're we're so fascinated in that time period where you know wrestlers had to go through great lengths to protect the business. Yeah, and there's so many amazing stories from that you know, that era, and you know a lot of these crazy stories are bred out of you know the having to protect the secrets in a, in a lot of ways and the lengths that they would go to. So, yeah, this is it's definitely that pivotal moment, like you said, where you know it's transitioning away from. Um, you know, the old guard protecting it at all costs. Yeah. And like one of the things that um, our show examines ever since the very first episode we ever did is just that kind of intersection between, you know, reality and wrestling fiction. And we've always been fascinated with that whole concept and how that interweaves into real life. And this, this episode was kind of like a way for us to, you know, talk about the F word, you know, in wrestling yeah. 
and and like and and to really kind of build upon that and because i mean that's a huge part of wrestling stigma is like you know a lot of people are just like why would you watch that it's fake you know and so i think for us it was like a a, a like a way to look at that part of wrestling history as well and you know and dr d was just always such a compelling character to us uh to examine anyway just because and I, and, and I also think when you look back and watch that episode, like, you know, you really realize, man, this industry has changed so much since then. It's like barely even recognizable in terms of just like how, you know, a person like, like Dr. D, like you, you don't see that type of guy in wrestling anymore. You know, that grizzled, no. real legitimate, believable dude like him. And so. Um, you know, because a lot of wrestlers nowadays kind of get into the business being a fan of the industry, where people like David Schultz, like, I mean, this was a, this was a job. This is yeah. something that, like, I, you know, it was either between this or working in the fields, I think, you know, for these, <laughs> these types of guys. And so it's just, uh, yeah, they just don't, they don't, they don't make them like they used to, I guess. Yeah, I feel like Brock is probably the last person who you would be afraid sure. to ask a question to. Like, Brock <laughs> is that guy sure. who you, you watch yeah. on TV and you're like, nope, that's just Brock. There's no character there. That just Brock is just Brock is just Brock. And, and, and yeah. yeah, I think, I think that there is, you're true. right. There's nothing, there's nothing like that anymore. Um, yeah. I also think that whether you guys know it or not, and I'm sure this happened in the first season too, there's certain, like, I think, uh, New Jack, Dr. D, and maybe a couple other people, I'm sure that their careers, as far as like taking a run on the convention circuit, probably goes through the roof mm. after these things. I have to imagine that like, you know, getting an autograph and a photo from Dr. D and New Jack probably went way up after these documentaries aired. Yeah, uh, and if you can get them together in one photo. That would be <laughs> yeah, yeah, because <laughs> New Jack, because they could, they could be like a whole new bounty hunter tag team. <laughs> Oh my god, that'd be amazing! I did see New Jack like he posted last night that he was like selling autograph figures on his website that he made, and like it blew up. Like people were just like, "Oh my god!" They were so excited, and I think he's attracted even a, a new fan base. Oh yeah, you know, wants that stuff, and it was sold out instantly. Like as soon as I went, I was just like, <laughs> "It's not even this up." Anyway. It's a, and you know, New Jack fits the mold of Dr. D, right? New Jack is that guy that you go like, I don't, I wouldn't mess with New Jack in real life. Yeah. I, I did, I did a, right. a an independent show. I was doing commentary. It was actually supposed to be New Jack's last match. It was like a, I don't know, some kind of triple threat with uh, Necro Butcher and maybe one other person. But it was supposed to be his last match. I think oh, it was Lord. the weekend of WrestleMania 29. And I right. was, I was just there to do commentary, and the match was right after intermission. So during intermission. New Jack called me over. He's like, "Hey, come here." I think, like, "Yeah, yes, New Jack, yes sir, yes, yes sir." And he was, uh, and he gave me and he yeah. had this big thing of uh, light tubes, you know, like the the fluorescent light tubes. And he was like, "I need you to put these under the ring, but make sure they're in the far right corner under the ring, the far right corner. <laughs> what corner?" And I was like, "The the the, the far right corner." He was like, the far right corner. No, put them in the wrong corner. I was like, yes, sir. Oh, and so man. I went out there, and I, they were covered in a blanket and everything so nobody could see, and I just kind of slid them under, and nobody noticed and everything. But I swear to you, <laughs> I'm now doing commentary for that match when we get back, and I, all I can think about is, oh, God, please let them be in the right yeah. corner. Or, you know, maybe New Jack forgot, and now he's checking the wrong corner, but that's still going to be me if New Jack checks the wrong corner. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, Mr. Jack, um, <laughs> my dad's in the audience. Do you mind if I get a few shots in, too? And, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah exactly. Or just, yeah, or just we, no selling. We had, like, <laughs> we had our own, like, kind of panic moment where, like, uh, right before, like, the night before shooting with him, uh, we had organized yeah. to, like, shoot his interview in this, like, beautiful theater, in, like, this very old theater in his hometown. And we got in the night before, like, super late. We're exhausted. Well, we had pitched it to him that it was, like, you know, it was, like, eight minutes from his, like, yeah. eight minutes walking distance from his house. So it was, like, hey, no biggie, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just, like, I'm laying in bed right before I go to sleep. Just, like, I should just check it over to see the location. You know, everything's all good. And I look it up the address on our map, and I, re I realize we're, like, over an hour away from the location. <laughs> and we're just, like, and I go to Evan's door at his hotel and we were just like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? Like, 
we can't just expect him to just like on his own like drive over an hour like we want him in the best mood like possible and so i remember yep. evan just, like got on the phone with our production manager and he's like i want you to do whatever you would do if it was dwayne johnson that you were picking <laughs> up and driving him an hour to a location yeah <laughs> yeah I was like get the best limo you know make, make it make it all happen you know and because, you know, it was, yeah, it was very scary because I was definitely picturing myself getting mass transited, uh, like, in a few hours, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, do, was I feel like New Jack is one where you walk in going, we might have to stretch to make an hour out of this. But then once I watched the episode and I realized that really you kind of, it was it's kind of divided into four parts, which is the beginning yeah. of New Jack's career and then mass transit and mm -hmm. then... Gypsy Joe, and then the other one, and I was like, "Oh, you could have easily, you could have easily done another. You probably could have done a three-hour doc just on New Jack." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, there's stories there so we had to stuff. cut out. Yeah, yeah. So much great stuff we had to cut out of that episode. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling my wife uh, that there was a New Jack documentary. She was like, "Who's New Jack?" And I was like, "You remember Beyond the Mat?" She's like, "Yeah, I remember Beyond the Mat." And I was like, "Remember that guy who was like, see my knuckles? There ain't none." She was like, "Yep, I remember New Jack." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Amazing. I'm I'm really looking forward to this week's episode, and that's why I wanted to have you guys on this week because this week's episode is Herb Abrams and his UWF. Mm. And Herb Abrams is something I've been fascinated by for a while because it's one of those names that gets thrown around a lot, and there's maybe right. I don't know. There's like three or four stories that are on the internet not a lot of stuff on the internet and then just like but it's usually like three or four stories but told 200 different ways so you never know exactly yeah. which one is the original or is this the same story but is it different or did he just do this same thing twice and and i mean <laughs> to me one of the great things is looking back at sort of bad wrestling and going how did this oh, yeah. how did this happen and I feel like UWF, that that's it to a T. From the beginning, like, my favorite thing is the starting point of UWF. When you go, okay, UWF, and you go, you mean Bill Watts is UWF after he took the territory? No, 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 no. Bill Watts didn't copyright UWF. So Herb Abrams came out and started a promotion by the exact same name because it wasn't copyrighted, <laughs> so why not? And you go from there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the the, the uh, Herb Abrams and the UWF story, I have to say, almost out of any other episode we've done, out of all 16, maybe maybe, maybe Gino being the only other e example, but yeah. really one of the only stories that we really knew almost next to nothing about before going into it. Um, and the whole genesis of doing this story for the show actually goes all the way back to before we even had the series greenlit. Um I was, uh, I actually was, you know, because Vice wanted us to um, obviously pitch all these different stories uh, when we were first developing the show. Mm -hmm. And um, I, re I reached out to a few people who I knew that obviously, you know, know a lot of crazy stories in this world. And, and Sean Oliver from Kayfabe Commentaries was one of those people that I reached out to because I figured, man, he's done so many wrestler shoot interviews so many interviews with wrestlers that he must have heard some crazy shit yeah. along the way so i figure why not just pick his brain plus, for, for stories? Plus, and it's not actually, like it's also he's like the one guy too that when he does his interviews like he'll go like well who's the one wrestling interviewer that would have a segment where just rate who has the biggest penises and you're like yeah yeah oh, sean, i know sean I know, oliver's yeah. the guy <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> stuff is pretty wild yeah i love but it but so anyway um <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, and and also I should say Jason and I have, have bought so many of his, you know, kayfabe commentary yeah. DVDs, like the Roddy Piper one, the Billy Graham, all that stuff. And um, so, so anyway, so we, uh, like, I, I called him just for story ideas. And the one, the one story he was like, well, the one you have to do, because it's so vice and no one's done it, is the Herb Abrams thing. And I never heard that name. It just kind of went in one ear and out the other. But he did tell me. You know, he was covered in baby oil, chasing, you know, hookers around with a baseball bat. You know, I was like, oh, my God, you know. And so that actually made it in. That story made it into the original pitch deck for the series. Mm -hmm. And I actually used that as a way to sell it to Vice. And uh, obviously, once we got up and running, 
it's just for whatever reason that just didn't stick as like something we should look into for season one. And I'm also, I'm kind of glad that it didn't um, because I think that maybe it might not have been as successful, you know, or, or, or not enough people would have seen it, um, you know, without having to establish a season one first. But anyway, so when it came time to season two, Sean had me on his podcast and he was grilling me essentially being like, wait a minute, man, I told you about this story and you didn't do it for season one. What the hell? And, you know, he was like, we don't need another Montreal screw job documentary. You know, we need this Herb Abrams story. What's the deal? And I, and I actually, and then, and then he just pitched it to me again, like on his show, like he was going through all the story points. And I was like, God, he's so right. Is this what I kept thinking? And I just felt so bad. So I, the next day I went to the office, and I just like, you know, basically made it like a, like a staff announcement that we are going to start looking into this story, ditch whatever plans we had before, you know, and then I actually pointed to Howard and I was like, you need to get on this immediately. Um, and uh, uh, who, and he, works, he works for us and he did a tremendous job in terms of research. And yeah, he just looked into the story and, and, uh, and we were off to the races and we just couldn't believe what we were uncovering and the people we were talking to. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome because here's I, I think here's what I know. I kind of know the wrestling part of it. You know, I know a little bit about the history of the promotion, UWF, and I know enough about, you know, the shows and kind of remember the shows being put on when I was a kid and have gone back and watched, you know, some of the shows that have popped up on YouTube and stuff. Um, and then beyond that, I know how he died, which to my knowledge, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that on the last night of his life he was – found in his office covered in baby oil butt naked it's either baby oil or vaseline depending on who i ask baby oil or vaseline <laughs> butt naked chasing a prostitute with a baseball bat high off his mind on cocaine he was arrested and under police custody had a heart attack and died is this true there are like several legends <laughs> uh, but there are commonalities between those legends, yeah. and I think the the baby oil and the cocaine <laughs> are definitely in all of those legends, and okay. I think a baseball bat's involved with all of them as well. Okay, but there we go through them all. Oh, like, good, a, a, good. A few yeah, this is definitely like you're definitely t uh, Tuesday night. You're gonna get the Rashomon of uh, this whole uh, incident as it. As it you know. I, I, I hope um, that, I hope the documentary but, I hope the documentary ends like the movie Clue, and then it goes, or here's what could oh, yeah. have happened, but here's what really yeah. happened. <laughs> that, that, that would be amazing, like, depending on which market you, you tune into our show on Tuesday night, you get a different ending. Yeah. Um, but, um, no, it, it, like, it, like, definitely, it, like, definitely is one of the, the harder things we've had to confirm, like, in terms of the details. And it's, like, everyone had, like, these different versions of what they heard and it's like but you know but this was reported in the newspapers so you know it's based in like somewhat of a you know verifiable fact it just was like it was a really hard thing for us to confirm in terms of like you know any sort of a like official you know police records or anything really but, you know obviously yeah but like a lot of the folks that like knew herb you know very well which you'll see in the documentary are getting information you know like right after it happened and so everyone has like a little bit of a different story in terms of what happened and we felt well we just we we better just you know kind of make the greatest hits of just different accounts of what, of what we think happened you know so hey, you got to be responsible you got to be responsible in your exactly in your storytelling um so right with uwf it was basically this promotion that i think had all the aspirations to be a mainstream promotion but none of the production value or wrestling to be a mainstream promotion. Um, you look back on it and it started like around 1990 and it was kind mm -hmm. of mainly filled with guys that you had seen previously in the eighties in WWF, uh, a couple of NWA runoffs and then some new talent. Mick Foley started with UWF yeah. um, and a couple of other people, uh, who was the who was the 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 blonde? Um, the there was Wild Ray? and Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray, yeah, not 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 Steve Ray, not Stevie Ray from Harlem Heat, but Steve Ray was a big uh, a big uh, 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 person there. And then wasn't yeah. uh, Jack Jack Armstrong? Is that right? 
He had like oh, man. Um, he's like a barrel think, chested well, you had, guy. You had Sunny Beach. You had, Sunny Beach, yeah. You had, you had Sunny, Sunny Beach and Steve Ray, who were who were the tag team Wet and Wild. Um, <laughs> yeah. You had, uh, you had, uh, well, you had, you know, you had Doctor Steve Williams, right. Obviously, who was a big name there. Right. Paul, Paul, Paul Orndorff yep. was there. Um, Captain Lou. Um, so he had, he had, the, he had those names, and then, um, oh, man, uh, and then he also had, which I think is a, is a character that a lot of people are going to be discovering on Tuesday night is he had, you know, cause Herb became his own kind of, you know, Mr. Mc, like proto Mr. McMahon character um, on, on the show. Like, I mean, he kind of made himself as the star of the show and he had his own adversary, which it uh, was a guy named Colonel red, uh-huh. who was like this managerial persona that was on UWF and man, the promos, <laughs> the promos, and the spots with Herb and Colonel Red are some of the most uh, oh, hilarious you. and memorable <laughs> aspects of the show, for yeah. sure. That, yeah. So you had all sorts of types. That's amazing. Yeah, and didn't didn't they have a uh, Colonel De Beers do like a super racist guy? I well, I know. Yeah, he was on the show. Yeah, he. Yeah, you're right. I think I think it was part of that promotion. We don't touch on that on Tuesday, but I mean, there's only so much you could possibly cover. You only got an hour to, to go through all this wonderful uh, wonderfulness, and then of course uh, the uh, the very subtle dig at Dave Meltzer, which was their jobber named Davey Meltzer. <laughs> right, which yeah. was the very first thing that ever was on the air for you to do, which is so which is so funny, and it's like. You know, Herb didn't obviously appreciate the way he was being portrayed in the dirt sheets when he was launching UWF. Uh-huh. So his his response was the very first thing you ever saw on the on the UWF Theory Hour was Doctor Death Steve Williams hash match beating up this guy named Davey Meltzer and then shoving a a piece of paper in his mouth and pouring dirt in it. So it's like <laughs> you know the dirt sheet, get it? I mean, you know, and it's just like this. It's amazing. Yeah, I think if you if you really yeah. search for the nuance, you might be able to find it in there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and he like he um like he announces UWF Federation like at um John Arezzi's like one of his uh weekend like fan conventions. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, at that time he announced that like Bruiser Brody was gonna be involved and Bruiser Brody was already dead at that point and he said that <laughs> Blackjack Mulligan was going to be doing booking for him, but he was in jail at the time. <laughs> so he was just making all these like elaborate like promises. But then eventually he did get um, Andre the Giant on board, which was like a huge yeah. win for him. That's and it. so he got Andre to come on for, I don't know, maybe like a couple of days to do some promos. Uh-huh. But then literally like the next day, like Vince McMahon like called Andre back up and <laughs> Him back in WWE. <laughs> oh, that was yeah. That was when uh, when Andre came back to like manage the Bushwhackers at SummerSlam '91. He took him yeah, right out yeah. from under Herb. Huh? Yeah. Oh, poor Herb. Yep. Poor, poor Herb. And that was one of the things that yeah, I know that was a big <laughs> shot for to him. Yeah, but but like one of the things that we kind of discovered along the way with doing this story is like, you know, you know, Herb was a Herb was a huge wrestling fanatic. You know, Herb was actually at the first WrestleMania. I like as a fan, you know, wrestling was his life. And, you know, he made a bunch of money uh, early on uh, with a clothing store chain that he had. And he just one day was like, I want to start my own promotion. Like, I believe I can do this. He had that big, you know, wrestling fan dream. And then, and then basically he started to piece this thing together and he started to recruit wrestlers at John Arezzi's fan weekend and putting this whole thing together. And he, is a very, like, from what we gather, a very charismatic dude. Uh And he just basically got all these guys to really buy into his vision. And, like, you know, it was kind of like they were all under this, like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's go out there and let's kick some ass and let's let's make this thing a real success. Everyone really believed that they were on course for success until these, these, like, you know, these, like, you know, checks were bouncing, you know, like, you know, a lot of empty seats. You know, a lot of empty seats <laughs> in some of the shows and, and, and all these things. And then people started to believe, well, this really isn't what it's cracked up to be. And so I always kind of look at it. Maybe it's a crude comparison, but I always kind of say this is sort of the fire festival of wrestling stories, you know, because, you know, you have you have the promise and you have 
you know, you have all the salesmanship and all the uh, charisma behind it. But then, like, you know, once you get there, it's a total disaster. Okay, it's funny that you say Firefest because, like, when I first read the description and kind of knowing the little that I know about Herb Abrams and the UWF story, I was like, okay, if I were to make this into a – first of all, I now I all I'm thinking about – I've been thinking about it for, like, a week now – is – making a Herb Abrams movie movie, like a, like a, like a yeah. actual, you know, movie with, cause I think it would just be amazing. So at first it's funny that you say Firefest Cause at first I was thinking this is like the Wolf of Wall Street version of wrestling or the wrestling version of Wolf of Wall Street. But I've now changed that since you were basically describing Herb Abrams just now, as we're having this conversation, Yeah, Herb Abrams yeah. is, and it's really kind of getting weird the comparisons. I don't know if you've seen The Room, but Herb Abrams is clearly the Tommy Wiseau of professional wrestling, <laughs> down to the fact that nobody knew where Tommy Wiseau got his money from, but he insisted that it was from a clothing company, Street Fashions USA. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's how uh, I'm sure there's there's definitely shades of some 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 Wiseau in there for sure. Um, but like it's also in well, also because you see, you know, obviously why so is making himself the star of the room, yep. you know, and this is kind of like, like there is some of that, you know, narcissism in there, I guess. But, you know, the thing with Herb is that I, that I will say, um, you know, is that there was a big question of where the money came from. And like, we know there was some finance financiers that came into the UWF along the way, but Herb had made all of his money from this this uh, this clothing company that he started, which was for big and tall women, <laughs> that's <laughs> called that was called. You, you can't write this. You can no, never write this. Of course, that's movie, where he made his money. It was called "I'm a Big Girl Now." Is what the <laughs> name of the store was. Um, <laughs> that's got to be the most so flattering like, place to go. Of course, where, if you're if you're if you're an oversized woman, you want to go to a store called "I'm a Big Girl Now." <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> But that's where the money, uh, you know, started that launched UWF, which is just amazing. And then, um, yeah, and then I think, you know, they're, they're also one of the things that was really interesting was that, you know, Herb had basically, when he started running shows, he felt that he could sort of be the West Coast WWF. And so he felt like, you know, maybe I should try and join forces with Vince McMahon. And wow. so, and, and, and this story is corroborated through, um, uh, one of the folks we interview, uh, his name is Lenny, and like Lenny was like the straight man in the story. He's like the real producer of the UWF. He was the guy that tried to keep everything together, tried to keep Herb sober, you know, and, and really tried to keep him focused. Like he's really, he's a great person too. What a great dude. But like Lenny basically, you know, confirmed that Herb had a meeting with Vince McMahon where he, where he pitched him like, let me, let me take the West Coast. You can you can keep the East Coast. Let me take the West Coast, you know. And then and then he and then obviously Vince was like, you know, take a hike, you know, <laughs> you know. But and and that was what really bruised, you know, Herb Ego and really kind of forced him on this path to, to to try and literally not just be competitive with WWF, but actually take them down. That was like his ultimate dream. He really like he seems there like there's a lot of spite in his style of promoting. The fact that he's mad at Dave Meltzer for writing nasty things about him. So he goes on television in his opening match of his promotion and does that, that he, he has a bad meeting with Vince McMahon. So now he's changed his goal and he wants to put Vince McMahon out of business forever. Like it doesn't seem necessarily like he's the most sound businessman. He, I feel like he might be a little bit more emotional than logic. Am I, am I right on with that? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, like, even to the point where you'll see, I'm kind of spoil spoiling it a little bit, but when you see the UWF like Sports Channel belt, like Television Heavyweight Championship belt, yeah. Oh. It's like yeah. when you realize the messaging behind it, because on either side of the strap it says UWF. Right. But when you like fold it to like hold it up, it just says F U on either side. <laughs> and, it, and it was like to it, it was literally him directing it towards Vince McMahon. <laughs> and like, yeah. I, after you see it, like the belt is actually quite beautiful. It is colorful, and and now an with that belt. meaning behind it, I think it's like the coolest, like one of the coolest wrestling belts ever. Yeah. yeah. After Tuesday night, it'll become the most sought after belt. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who, of all time. Would well, you it's know? A incredible historical artifact that you know it's priceless. 
Do you have any idea who owns the IP? Like who 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 owns the copyright? Like who can make those replica belts? That's a really That's good question. Good question. I mean, yeah, like from what I understand, like the UWF IP is kind of a, a big question mark <laughs> of because course it I is. think Herb, because I, I don't know if it was really ever settled, you know, before Herb died. So I right. I, I don't know. It, it it could be with the family, but yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Was there at any point, how soon did people realize? Because like I watch it and when I see the final product, like even in that first episode and you can find stuff on YouTube. If you look up Herb Abrams, UWF, you can find old shows. I think like uh, the beach brawl, they did one pay-per-view called beach brawl. And I think that that's up there, Oh yeah. but you can clearly see that this is not a promotion destined for success. Like you can clearly, clearly see that the money that has been invested has not been invested in the right places. I have to imagine that it was pretty quick that checks were bouncing and wrestlers were figuring out like, oh, okay, this might be a money grab more than a, hey, this is this is this is the team I'm going to put on my back. Well, there's one thing I'll say about that is is you know like a lot of guys were obviously getting stiffed on pay like like you were saying, which is which is the thing that we 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 look at extensively on in the episode. But when we interviewed Mick Foley, it's like, you know, Mick Foley came out of a situation in WCW where he felt like, you know, he was pretty stifled in terms of what he could do creatively. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, knowing now what we know about Mick, he's, you know, he's an incredible artist in this in this world. Right. So um, he always felt like even though sometimes the money, you know, wasn't right and, you know, things were screwy, but he had so much freedom I to see. really kind of discover himself in the UWF. And so he attributes that time to being able to really hone the character of Cactus Jack because of basically not having anyone telling him what to do. And so that's really interesting too. And that was really cool, you know, when, when, when he brings that up in the interview and talking about, you know, that like he had that opportunity with the UWF. So I, I guess for some, you know, like for him, obviously it, it was, it was kind of a, a, it was a total necessary period that I think he went through. So then, you know, then he could eventually ascend, you know, into what he became. Right. Yeah. And have the confidence to be like, I know this works because I've done it before because I had the opportunity to do it. But right. Ha having that freedom, I also feel like, look, I mean, UWF did not have the greatest booking in the world. Lots of double count outs, lots of disqualifications, <laughs> lots of rematches yeah. that also ended in double count outs and disqualifications. Sort of, it screamed to the person who's been watching wrestling for a long time, neither of these two legends want to do a job to the other one. And I don't think that, <laughs> I think that, that they probably, I'm assuming must have gone to Herb and say, I'm not losing to this guy, I'm not losing to that guy. But Herb just figured, put him in the ring and just schmoz the finish, and we still have the match, and everything's yep. fine. Yeah, it's funny. We, we talked to Mick Foley last night, and we were just kind of reminiscing about it. And he was saying how, like, Herb came up to him, and uh, I think it was for the Blackjack problems, and, and said yeah. he, want, he wanted yeah. to go over on, he wanted him to go over on Snooka. Uh -huh. And Mick was, like, really taken back. He's like, holy shit. But he wanted Mick to break the news to Snooka. <laughs> Oh man, and you know, and they're supposed to do this like lumberjack match, and so he, he walked up to Snooka, and he's just like, he's like, "Hey, brother, how about you know double count out?" And Snooka was like, "Yeah, brother, that's great." <laughs> yeah. so, but no, the thing, but then, but then, like, they didn't know how to do because it's a lumberjack match. Yeah, There's no count out. No, of course no not. And so, yeah, so like, you know, he he basically in the middle of the match, like Brian Blair is like, "What are you guys doing?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and then like Mick is shouting back to, you know, uh, like Brian Blair saying, it's a double count out. Well, there's no double count out to lumberjack matches. And Mick shouts back, it's Herb's show. We can do whatever we want. You know, and like, you know, they're in a 14,000 seat venue and 200 people are there. So, I mean, it really is kind of a, you know, like, we can do whatever we want. But that's, yeah. that's yeah. so great, though, that it's even worse than you would think, where it's not even like Herb didn't have the backbone to tell somebody that they lost Herb sent the guy. He sent Mick to tell Snooka and Mick didn't want to tell him that. So Mick said double count out. And and then, and Herb just finds yeah. out the finish of the match is a double count out as he's watching the match. 
Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and that's a theme that you see throughout the whole story, which is you, you really see that this is just this whole thing. At, at, at one point, the UWF, and it just becomes a complete imp- improvisation, spreading <laughs> water, you know, and like, and, and, and that's the scary thing about it. Because obviously, you know, Herb has demons and, you know, which we definitely get into in yeah. terms of his drug use and partying and everything. And, and all these guys are just kind of along for this ride that is, that is totally, yeah, just like it, being improvised as they go on. Yeah, um, that's and, amazing. And that's just, that obviously, you know, would make a great movie, like for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Brian Blair talks about it as like, you know, this is Herb's world and we're and they're just all living in it, you know. Right. You just yeah. get to go on that ride for a short period of time. You're like, look, this is what we're doing right now. Let's just see what this world is like, and then we're gonna step out before it gets really scary. Yeah, but like Mick had like a kind of like a, a like a good perspective on it. Like his thing was when he would walk into those arenas, and there was only like a hundred to two hundred people in there. Mm-hmm. He felt like he had just like more freedom to like experiment and like try some weird stuff. Sure. And so for him, it he didn't mind that. You know, he just like his his yeah, spirit I love that perspective. Was, yeah. Yeah. Now I read that. Uh, he was given a million dollars from Sports Channel America to do the show. Herb Abrams was not Mick Foley. Herb Abrams. Um, do yeah. you know if that's true? Well, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, again, like in the beginning, you know, Herb was this very, um, you know, he could charm you. He could sell you. He was a good salesman. And he actually sold Sports Channel America on doing the show without a pilot or without any any sort of you know sizzle reel or anything Uh so they actually gave him you know they actually ordered uh the what became the uwf theory hour they they ordered that without seeing anything wow you know so that just kind of goes you know i mean who knows what we would have if that would have even if uwf would even be a thing without that and that's the thing like in the beginning a lot of the guys talk about is he was throwing money around presumably his own money around um, in the beginning that really got a lot of people, you know, charmed to, to him. And they were kind of under that herb spell. Right. Because we even talk like I was talking about Colonel Red, who who uh, I'm sure will be the star of the show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tuesday night. Um, he kind of talks about like being wine to dine pretty, pretty heavily uh, coming in to the fold and just being like, wow, like this hotel suite that like in Beverly Hills that I've never even experienced anything like this in my life. And like, you know, that's like wild. And like, I never would have thought I would be privy to that. And then, you know, yeah. So I I think he enchanted a lot of people with his, you know, his, his vision was throwing money around and and really got to that point. But then when it came to, to deliver and to make the product, right. You know, it was definitely a completely different story. Well, it's one of those, it seems like it's one of those classic stories, which are so fascinating for me who like, I, I feel like I have to kind of plan most of what I'm doing and know, okay, here, this is going to work out and here's my plan B and here's my plan C and here's my plan D. I love stories of people that are the opposite. I love stories of people (laughs) that just have this grand vision and they make a ton of promises and they go, well, I don't know. I just figured out when I get there (laughs) and just, and just go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah, And I, I I just love it because people who just keep talking, they just never stop talking to the point where you're like, all right, let's just see where this goes. Let's, let's see. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, this this whole experience making this episode is just like, you know, it just kind of showed us too that there are so many kind of hidden hidden in plain sight stories that could be like covered, you know, for this show, like more so, and just like the potential of like, I, like I think I can speak for you, Jason, in just terms of saying like the most fun episodes we have of this sh- making the show are ones in which we don't know anything about when we go in. Yeah, yeah, and I also like, do love like you know, highlighting and living in the world of like a, a federation, like, or like these small yeah. in, uh, promotions. Cause like they, each one has like these dreams behind it, you know, like every promoter has these like grand dreams. And I think people can connect to that, but there's like with every little indie uh, promotion, I find there's like, there, there's like these really hidden gem stories behind them. And they each have their own aesthetics to them in a really fun way. Like, we got really obsessed with um, in the New Jack episode. Um, uh, there's this character in it who goes by MWW, 
uh-huh. and he had a little <laughs> motion uh, called Thunder Wrestling, and like they made artwork and everything for it. Um, and there's and the the cast of characters that are involved just in that little indie promotion. I'm sure, and I know there's like so many stories just behind that, just that one. And so I know like the Definitely. UWF, there's like there's others out there that we could you know live in. I know for for an hour's worth of time because uh, definitely yeah. yeah. So uh, there's one thing that I've seen online that I don't know if it gets tackled in the documentary or not, but I feel like it is so UWF. It's uh, and it might be from Blackjack Brawl. It's uh, Mondo Guerrero, and he's coming out, <laughs> and when he when he comes to the ring. The song Rico Suave is a big hit. So I'm assuming it was supposed to be Rico Suave or maybe it was a, a, a rib or I don't know what happened. But Mondo Guerrero is coming to the ring and Taco Grande, the Weird Al parody of Rico yeah. Suave, is playing him to the ring. And I'm like, he's got like the bandoliers on and everything and he's Mondo Guerrero. And then you just hear Weird Al behind him going, Taco Grande. Yeah. Oh. Grande. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, um, God, that, that is it's one upsetting. of the funniest things ever. <laughs> but it's you know, obviously, you know, like, not, it, it's not something we covered in the episode, you know, mainly because, I mean, how much would that joke cost? Um, yeah, it's true. The thing is, like, it's so good. And it, again, just goes to show you, like, there's so many aspects in this story that, like, you cannot write, even if you tried, even if you sat down and tried, you yeah. would never be able to come up with, the scene where Mondo Guerrero comes out to Taco Grande. There's just no way. Um, and it's just, it's just amazing that the things that like that <laughs> happen in the UWF. Did you get any, incredible. do you get any insight to why that happened? Just n- not that it's in the movie, but just for my own personal <laughs> edification. No, unfortunately not. I mean, maybe, I, maybe I can make some phone calls for you. I would love to find out because I'm fascinated by that. Why, like, I feel like I want to do a one hour documentary just about that entrance. <laughs> um, do you so know? Amazing. So they did, I guess, Blackjack Brawl. That was the live show and that was their last show, correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe so. I believe so. Because yeah. that was a pretty big show. I mean, Sid was on that show. Dan Spivey was on that show. That was that was big. That was like ninety four, I think. Yeah, yeah, he got the he got the MGM yeah. brand for that for that too, which was a huge get for him. Now I'm going to ask you guys. Yeah. Um, I mean, I... Was the MGM grand when they did Blackjack Brawl? Did they fill it up? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> okay. um, that's the show where yeah they had the two hundred two hundred two hundred. 200 to 250 people at the at the uh, the 14,000 seat venue, <laughs> oh, which is just uh, you know, it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> that whole scene in the show on Tuesday is uh, is pretty amazing, and I, I'm not going to spoil it. I Please assume, don't. But Mick Mick has an incredible. Um, I'll, I'll just tease it. Mick Mick has an incredible moment um, when you know he he thought once and for all, okay. Maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe Herb has been able to, to finally figure this thing out because we got the MGM Grand, baby. And then he has, a, he has an encounter with Herb, I think, the night before or the day of. Uh-huh. And then when he starts seeing what Herb is talking about, he's like, oh, no way. This is going to be a success. And that's one of my uh, favorite moments uh, in the whole episode. Oh, oh, I can't wait. I really can't wait. Was there a plan? Because the show, like, the show isn't booked like a – this is our last show in business. Like you literally at one point have the, the Spivey and Sid, uh, the twin towers kind of either reuniting or breaking up. I don't know. Something went on with the two of them on that show. Um, was, was there like a, I mean, I guess there was never a plan, right? But was there a plan coming out of blackjack brawl that just never came to fruition? Or was this just sort of the way of life for Herb Abrams? Yeah, as far as I know, like, you know, he always kind of was trying to get things, you know, back to the way they were from that 94. He, you know, he passed away in 96. Right. And so I think in that in that period, he was really trying to get things going again. But I think that's really the time when, you know, he was really struggling with addiction um, and his, you know, his 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 whole vices and everything. And somebody yesterday while we were doing the live, we were doing a Facebook live with, with, with Mick Foley, and somebody said that there was artwork created 
for uh, which I didn't know, but there was artwork created for a 1996 blackjack brawl that was supposed to take place, I believe, in California. Yeah, and it had like Saint Valentine's Massacre or something like that, right? Yeah, and it had like Mick. Mick was on the card, but like Mick would have already (laughs) been, you know, talked to WWE. So I don't know. Like it's it's you know it's one of those just things. And 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 then the episode, he also uh, we also you know he was he was kind of pleading to Lenny, who was you know his partner for so many years, like Lenny, I'm straight, you know, and there's like big big plans in the future, Lenny, you know, and. And you have to kind of, you know, by that point, kind of roll your eyes a little bit. You do. And you can like, and I like goofing on it and like, you know, pointing out all the silliness of it. But there's also this thing. I have this soft spot for anybody that just never quits. Like somebody that has a dream and wants to do something and as ridiculous as it gets and as bad as it gets and as much as the entire world is saying, what are you doing? This is dumb. Just never never quits i love stories of people whether they succeed or not even if they never succeed the fact that they never quit and just kept going yeah i mean i love yeah love that in a real way yeah same here and you do like even through the course of discovering the story like as you are like gathering more details and hopefully you'll feel that in the episode is that like you kind of are rooting for her like you want him to succeed like his dream and his ambitions is so there's there's so much charisma behind it and you you just you want to get behind it and he's take he's trying to take on Vince McMahon and it's just you know you really do want to see him you know make it but you know he just drags everyone down yeah yeah and 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 also like i think too one thing that people will be a little surprised at when they see the episode is that you know i think everybody involved for the most part not everyone but for the most part you know, even though they got stiffed on pay and things didn't wa- work out and, and these dreams didn't come into fruition, I think everybody at the end of the day really liked her as a guy. You right, know? right. Um, and that's kind of saying something like after kind of screwing people over <laughs> and having these big false promises. But, you know, I think everybody was really endeared to him, you know, and I think that uh, I, I certainly was not expecting how many people were, ge- were actually getting emotional during their interviews in talking about Herb and also talking about even the way he died. And like, even though that's such a spectacular, like unbelievable way to go out, like even, even Brian Blair talking about it, like gets emotional, you know, you know, and, and that's kind of one of the things you forget. Like it's such a spectacular thing to read about, but then like, I guess if you knew the guy and knew what he was really struggling with, you know, it's like, it, it is, it is scary. And it's also sad. And, um, you know, Colonel Red, like I was set, mentioning, who will be like one of the MVPs on Tuesday night, he also kind of mentioned to me, he actually mentioned to me when he was talking about it, the way the Herb went out, is he was saying, like, if you were to see that in a movie or a TV show, you, know, you would really think that that's, you know, a funny, crazy scene. But to see it with your own eyes, you know, must have been a completely different story. And, and that's true. Yeah. Know? And to For know sure. the guy, too, right? To know, like, because that's what we forget, like, especially being wrestling fans, like, we could build these characters in our heads and and that's what he is. And we can consider Herb Abrams and his wrestling career and his death, all part of this like wild character and just tell stories because you forget that he's a human being. Like he's just a person, right? Yeah. Like he, I think like, you know, he was like a huge wrestling fan and chasing down, you know, his like favorite wrestling legends and maybe wanted to be uh, like a legend in his own right. And he did become one. I'm not sure if that, if it was the way in which he had planned to become one, but you know, I well, think or did. Yeah. And also like one of the other things too about him that maybe doesn't come through the episode um, as much as it should, but the other thing too about him that's really interesting is that, you know, look at the landscape of wrestling in 1991 and kind of the direction it was going in was very cartoony. Right. And, and I think one of the things that was very important to him was that he wanted wrestling to go back to the way that it was. So he was kind of, you know, as a fan, from a fan perspective, he was kind of a traditionalist and a purist. And he also kind of saw these guys like Paul Orndorff and, you know, who had a few more years left in him and some of them kind of being discarded and going by the wayside. And he really kind of felt like there was more to get out of them. So, you know, that was also kind of a thing for him too that was important was like showing you wrestling, or that's what he was trying to do. Is showing you wrestling kind of in the way that you remember it 
sort of that kind of a vibe, like a more, you know, but obviously, you know, some things didn't turn out that way, but that was his intention anyway, which is a good place to come from at that time. Right. Yeah. There's, there's two kind of promoters that end up with, you know, checks bouncing and, and, and people not getting paid. One is that like scumbag promoter that's just trying to take money from everybody and the other one right. is the person that is legitimately spending all his money. Like, you're not sitting here. It doesn't, you, I don't think that Herb Abrams was getting rich while nobody else was, unless I'm wrong. I mean, I obviously I'll learn on, t- on, on well, Tuesday. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, like, again, like he was the type of guy where he, he would bounce your check. Yeah. But if he, like, took you out to dinner you know, he dropped like a grand on you, right? You know, he was like that kind of a guy. And then, that, I mean, that's, an, you know, that kind of speaks to his personality right there. Yeah. But also like, you know, there, there were investors, not all of this is his money. And then right. you kind of see, well, like, you know, that's an easy thing to do with other people's money. And then it kind of gets into like, the, oh, okay, you know, um, right. okay. You know, type of thing where, yeah. you know, if, if, it, if it was his hard earned money, maybe it'd be a different story, but so yeah, it just is a little, you know, once you start to realize that, you know, where the money's going, you know, <laughs> it's not going into the promotion, then it's okay. It's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes those demons creep back in, right? There you go. Yeah. Demons. Yeah. Demons. Um, <laughs> Demon. Do you guys have, is there any talk of Dark Side of the Ring season three yet? I feel like season two has been a grand success so far. Yeah, there's there's definitely talk. Um, you know, I, I think Vice is, is uh, has uh, you know wants to make it happen. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainties in the uh, in the world yeah. right now in terms of travel, and travel is such a vital part of the show. So we have to kind of wait and see what happens with the world. Um, but I think yeah, I think I think Vice really wants to see it happen. You know, there's there's, there's no shortage of stories that that we would want to explore for this world. And I think, um, you know, season two was really cool for us because I think it, it, it really showed that, you know, um, stories like Dr. D, which, you know, are, are, are you know, a little more niche, I guess, even in this world, and maybe Herb Abrams, you know, yeah. and, and it can kind of really show that those types of stories, you know, can do very well. So I think that'll, that'll give us the opportunity to explore, you know, some even, some even more obscure uh, stories if we do a season three. So yeah, I think, you know, we have to kind of see how the world, uh, what happens there. And then if, you know, and then if we can, if we can, um, you know, make, make, a, make some good arrangements with Vice and yeah, we should be, we should be off to the races then. Look, however you have to do it, you guys have to figure out how to never stop making wrestling documentaries. Cause I will just watch them forever. Um, I do have, I do have a request, uh, for season three. Sure. Yeah, please. Uh, the heroes of wrestling pay-per-view. Oh, I mean, to me, I remember the Heroes of Wrestling pay per view. One of my favorite things in wrestling. I rem- I I I did not learn of this later. I watched it live as a kid. Wow! Because they're advertising all these legends that are going to be there, and Yokozuna, and this guy, and that guy, and just it was really my first introduction to how bad wrestling can go because I hadn't seen a lot of indie wrestling. I hadn't I hadn't watched wrestling disasters because I was a kid and had really only watched WWE where everything looks so, you know, produced and polished. And to watch this pay-per-view and go, oh my God, like what's happening in front of my yeah. eyes? And then to see the legend grow after that, I have so many questions about the entire show. I want to know about how it was promoted. Yeah. I want to know about the guys involved. I mean, I would love to speak to... Uh, Stan Lane and Tully Blanchard about, you know, how is there one, there's one good match on the whole show. Like that, that to me is one of the weirdest parts of the show that you watch the Tully Blanchard Stan Lane match and you go like, Oh yeah, that's a really good match. And you go like, what universe is that taking place in that it existed with all this other stuff going on, on this pay-per-view. That's great. Wow. Yeah. Like- we really yeah, love I'll, like I'll the, the the stories that center around like an event, and that we can yeah. Be able to, I was going to say that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, yeah, I, and and I I was I was just going to say I would definitely give you credit on that too because that one no one's ever pitched to us before. I've never heard uh, of that as a as a possible idea for an episode, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make, and then like they say that uh, 
that that they were supposed to be. I think they were they were, the promoter wanted to run them quarterly, except it was literally the the most lowly bought pay per view in the history of professional wrestling. So it was certainly a no go. And the, the main event got changed day of. And Yoko's. I mean, the whole thing is just it's just really? amazing. Yeah. Do you have less than <laughs> even the, the UWF Beach Brawl was only like it sold between like a hundred and a thousand pay per views. Oh, um, okay. All right. Maybe it was. Maybe it was more than yeah. Beach Brawl then. <laughs> and it was actually when we were doing um when we were doing our uh, narration with Chris Jericho. It was funny. Oh, I was gonna say this her, episode. Yeah. yeah, he uh he said that when he was young, he was one of the one of the people who bought the Beach Brawl pay per view. <laughs> and we were just blown away by that. That's awesome. Yeah, and he said that the uh, Chris Chris said also said that the audio. The audio didn't work or something in terms of like getting it like, like I, I think him and Lance Storm like kind of had some like pirate set up or something where they were getting pay per view or I don't know how like in Canada like yeah, they got yeah. it but like <laughs> but like the audio didn't work uh -huh. and so they were like forced to do their own commentary for Beach Ball so somewhere <laughs> out there in the universe and I know Lance has tried to dig it up because I've been we've been trying to figure this out but there is a tape somewhere maybe it's gone but of Chris oh. Jericho and Lance Storm doing commentary on beach brawl which UWF. i mean and the, the fact that now you've got a documentary about uwf on vice literally at the same time as chris jericho is doing commentary on tnt and you've got this tape that exists we need to find it immediately i know i, I know i actually texted chris about it the other day and he's like oh i checked with lance and he can't he can't find it <laughs> um everyone out there check the other vhs tapes if you're in a yeah, place with maybe, vhs tapes just check them Double check them. Yeah, check them and check them and see if you got them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and like 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 one of the other just like funny little Jericho details on it too is that you know the the beach brawl pay per view took place at the Manatee Civic Center in Palmetto, Florida. That's where they did the event, and it was you know it was a major disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris Chris debuted. His WCW debut was at the Manatee Civic Center, <laughs> and that was the first place that he debuted. And he he told us a story of like when he got there, he like walked in and he was just like, "Whoa, this is where Beach Brawl was." <laughs> you know, like taking a moment to like to like That's realize so like he's on he's on sacred ground. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, so amazing. It's perfect. Well, do you have any uh, now that I've pitched you Heroes of Wrestling? I mean, obviously, without spoiling, are there any stories that you want to tell specifically at some point? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's like a lot of stories that, that like Jason and I, and we did this for season two also. Is mm -hmm. We held a lot of them. We like held a lot of our cards. We didn't want to show too much because, you know, we, we, we definitely, some of the stories we want to make sure we're pitching to the families first. Right. And, you know, make sure to get there okay first before we just blab about it all over the internet. But one of the stories that I have, thrown out there because i think it would be really interesting and it goes back again to the making of one single event which mm -hmm. i think would be an incredible story which is the the wcw event in north korea i think would be uh, an incredible uh, episode i've talked to eric yeah. bischoff about that a little bit just because yeah, i'm thanks. so fascinated by the whole thing i think that's a great idea cool. yeah so that's definitely the one that i would probably put into action pretty much right away if, if yeah. we get the uh if we get to go ahead yeah yeah well, awesome, guys. Uh, you know what a fan I am of your work. Um, I think it's great. Thank you. And I think everybody should be out there uh, watching them. They're, it's just it's just so uh, – the stories are great, and the presentation is done well, and it's entertaining, and everything goes, like, lightning fast. It's just – it's a lot of fun. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys talking to me, and I can't wait to learn more about Herb Abrams on Vice on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Thank right. you. Thank you, guys.